Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Burman or Burmese warfare, especially between the 11th and the 13th century, which is at least as far as the compaction of um, the major Burmese power is concerned, and so also the, the level of um, documentable warfare. Um, the most important part of, of the Middle Ages. This is interesting because we have seen how essentially in Europe mostly um, look at Western warfare, but there is a dynamic for which the 13th century is really the peak um, of medieval civilization, then things crumble and fragment. This was the case of Burma as well, right? The Mongols catalyzed dramatically this process, um, at least the end of it, in fact, at the end of the 13th century. Um, and unfortunately, such uh, devastation prevented us from also documenting a significant amount of Burmese warfare before uh, this period that truly had produced uh, a lot. But as you know, the Mongols were not exactly you know, people particularly sensitive to things like, you know, um, human mercy. And uh, as, you know, Western most, they destroyed cities like Baghdad, for example, and that was also one of the other tra greatest tragedies in the history of mankind for all what went lost um, in the process. We have also to, to appreciate, again, that those were the times that this is the world we're looking at, um, and that can help us understand something about the Burmese as well. Uh, Burma and Burmese are still undecided what to use, they're both correct, but um, the picture here is fairly simple, given that this is actually a, a video about general warfare for the, let's say, the, the new series on Eastern Asian warfare, especially the Chinese one and everything that, you know, interfered with um, with the empires so of these other powers that were invaded by China, in fact, just like the Mongols were doing at this point. And because, of course, there is not an overwhelming amount of information, at least readily available, to find about Burma, um, I will condensate everything from this sort of general sketch about uh, Burmese military history to the uh, army organization, the major battle of the period that is the one of Bochan, 1272, uh, and some arms and armor from the few evidence available and some broader insight on, on this entire uh, picture. Then, of course, we will come back, uh, probably not as frequently as we do for Western warfare, on, on the same topic to, in depth when I'm gonna have something, in fact, more detail, etc. But as, as an intro, I think it can be relatively uh, satisfactory. So if we want to begin from the beginning, you know, and at least in, in a medieval sense, in a high medieval sense, we um, want to appreciate how the Burmese power w was founded um, in this period. We, of course, have to go as back as the... Uh, the earliest inhabitants of at least recorded history. Uh, that is the Tibet of Burmese speaking uh, population that established the Pew city states ranging as far south as Pi and adopting, by the way, the Theravada Buddhism that is credited as essentially the most original, the really most ancient one. Um, and uh, this people is essentially the one, in fact, that. Um, developed this series of centers that uh, were relatively sheltered from the, the bigger civilizations, but were essentially in between India and China, and thus received um, also through the sea. Um, and you know that the country develops uh, across the Iravadi Valley. It is still today the, the most important commercial route within uh, within Myanmar, and uh, that is uh, has actually other... Um, other courses uh, within that, however, flow uh, to the Indian Ocean. And that's where predictably then the, the country is sheltered by mountain ranges that separate from Cambodia in the east. Then there is this sort of buffer area that is also called Upper Burma that is 
importantly influenced by China historically. There is Tibet in, in the Northwest, I made a video about Tibetan warfare, and when we look at the uh, the, the Burmese at this point, in fact, we're looking at the, the Tibetan Burmese speaking peer, all right? So uh, um, a blend of these various cultures uh, from which we can also get a bit of an insight of, of, of their military, all right? They, as having founded uh, city-states, it's, it's, it's a big war, but fundamentally it's very important centers around which the uh, the rest of of course of the agricultural um world uh, revolved um they um made it prosper in the first millennium ad right um in the 8th century the chinese tell us that um there were 18 pu states um throughout the irrawaddy valley and the the Chinese saw in this Burmese a uh, somehow peaceful population. They said that war was virtually unknown, to the point that this apparently meek people would wear only uh, silk cotton instead of actual silk, uh, so that they wouldn't have to use violence to kill the silk worms. Right. So we can't legitimately. Uh, realized that um, there was a bit of poetry and somehow um, wishful thinking uh, about this Chinese interpretation that, of course, is just, in, in the Chinese mentality of the time, a way of saying something else, that is to say this, this population had, uh, as Lutwak would say, even though I don't like the terminology used, a, a low-intensity warfare area, right? Um, given the um, structure of, of the country, as we will see now, we first realized that there weren't major, um, inter say, radical uh, divisions that uh, could stem from a I don't know a, an ethnic problem, and or when even when there are invasions and pretty violent uh, events occurring, the situation fundamentally stabilizes from a center. And actually, warfare is present. There is a lot of infighting between the various city-states, but of course the resources are fairly modest, or a lot of raiding warfare, um, in a way there is also infiltration, as we'll see now from the north, which is what um, puts an end to the uh, city-states period. Um, but that actually just refuels an internal system that is, mm, together with, say, the Middle Ages, maturing into something um, more developed, right? The earliest extant record of uh, warfare in the Pew city-states in the early 9th century, when raids began to occur from the north, from Upper Burma, um, from the realm of Nanzhao, right, there were other essentially Tibeto-Burmese-speaking um, people, called also the Mranma, in fact, uh, you can say Burmese or Bamar for, for this reason. Right, um, and uh, the Nanzao were essentially more warlike peoples than the ones uh, down the Irrawaddy and uh, Chindwin rivers. Uh, it's a pattern we've seen in other in other situations. So there are the more continent, say the more mountain peoples that have less resources need to expand to raid with greater frequency because of relative scar uh, scarcity of resources in local and going down to the south of the milder weather, the more fertile lands that are also relatively more soft and up, right? So Nanzao had just become, in fact, to become a major military power in the region at this point. Um, they had defeated the same Tibetan Empire in 801, and again, I, I think I talked about this in a video about Tibetan warfare, even if, if it is slightly more centered on, on the relations with, with China at large. Um, and that's when the Nanzao warriors began to push southwards into the present-day Shan Hills, uh, into the Irrawaddy Valley, right? And this was a sort of um, avalanche that overwhelmed this ancient uh, Pew city-states, that gradually surrendered by uh, one by one, um, or were overrun entirely. Like there was a phase of destabilization of some of these centers that had already underwent some sort of decline. But we're talking about the early Middle Ages, right? So they they had been, 
you know, contracting just like um, in the normal pattern, like of Eurasia, like antiquity was a more prosperous period. The early Middle Ages weren't. Uh, and this was a sort of Carolingian, you know, coming back of some sort from in, in the region um, from this um, mountain years. Um, there was an, a, a marked idea that, in fact, the uh, the Nanzao were quite influenced by the, in fact, the equestrian warfare of, of Tibet, that, as we've seen, was one of the most traumatically and violently feudal once in in the in, in in the world at the time, um, and uh, definitely not matching you know an idea of of pacifism or, or whatever one may think right they were actually the barbarians right from from a Chinese perspective but they were also quite capable and they were quite sheltered in a way but some some of them would of course push in this other directions to hand informed this uh, Tibet of Burmese. Um, warfare that is an hybrid, as the same name tells us. So much so that the sources on the occasion of this uh, conquest speak of the powerful mounted archers from the north, referring to the Nanzao, um, and that is quite eloquent, because it's definitely a, a Tibetan thing, right? Many people, even some scholars, thought at some point that uh, the Burmese were mostly about infantry, because, you know, this sort of Asian tonic um, population living in a fertile valley. And in part, it is like that. But the elite was brutally and um, you know uh, fanatically uh, aristocratic, of course, and 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 feudal at least in origin, right? So they they had a pretty strong elite and also some important mounted forces next to the the Indian elephants that were a thing. But there was an important um, horse component. Uh, as well, including heavy cavalry uh, in a in a in a truly heavy sense. Um, in 832, Nanzao destroyed the city state of Alin that was close to Old Tagang. Uh, they they would come back three years later to carry off many captives, right? And it is in fact, in, in spite of the well, the land is fairly open, right? But it's a, uh, you know, the the say it was not uh, completely cleared or. Uh, or reclaimed one, right? So, but you want to appreciate that is Nanzao cavalry to have apparently swept down all the way to the Bay of Bengal, despite the stiff resistance that the the, the Burmese were putting up um, uh, in this, uh, you know, in, in the way that the military organization we will talk about in a while will, will explain us better. Um, it's a it's a disorderly picture, right? There wasn't a strong unitary central power, nor from one side or the other. So everything was much messier than uh, otherwise, and uh, it, it you we have to imagine like this this warriors from the mountains opening their 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 own path into this um, heavily populated area, and you know meeting resistance from the villagers, from the various city states, or whoever right could catch also in out isolated one of these horsemen and, and taking them down with with archers with infantrymen um, and also with their own cavalry for that matter facing elephants um, and so on um, so the after this raids right the Nanzao settled as conquerors in the center of the Iravadi valley near the confluence, in fact, with the um, the, the Chindwin River, and that's where they concentrated, um, en masse, in, in, in a in a way. The Burmans, at that point, founded a small fortified city. That is the one of Pagan or Bagan that would give the name actually, because it will become the center over time of of a essentially this Burmese realm that, uh, in fact, for centuries ruled the land, um, encompassing basically the entire country and beyond uh, with influence and deterrence before being destroyed by the Mongols. We are in 849, right? Um, it's likely that Bagan was founded, just like many other fortresses, to simply pacify the surrounding countryside. It's a sort of, again, a feudal situation in many ways. Um, we know at this time, of course, being there 
a, a relatively simple uh, recruitment system. The majority of the population, of course, were agriculturers. They were raised as conscripts en masse prior or during wartime. Um, it seems, as we will see also in a bit more of, of a detail, in trying to, to identify some prototypes of, of warrior, that the, the main weapon was uh, spears, of course, bows, swords, um, and infantry units, however, fought essentially alongside cavalry and the elephant corps. And it seems that this, this was in fact the decisive arm, the dominant one. So infantry was not decisive, uh, even though uh, it uh, it would turn out to be at least while fighting the Mongols and losing to them, because at least that was a people that, as we will see now, would dismount to face um, the enemy on that occasion. Um, but it's important to appreciate again that the com a bit like in India, we've seen it in different videos that the compaction of the elite, of the mounted elite, and the sort of lesser status of, of the rest um, that would fight brilliantly on foot and so you have like in an early high medieval context the predominance of cavalry that could at times be defeated but would have the, the upper hand uh, most of the time it's the, the war elephants definitely that catch the, the, the greatest attention we will talk about them later and this thanks to Marco Polo, because that's uh, who tells us about the Battle of Ochan, and so the, say, the most uh, reliable, say, the most developed, actually, also account of uh, on uh, on Burmese warfare uh, at that point, right? Uh, if you look at two centuries later, in 1044, that is the year of the accession of the king Anvratha, the one small include uh, its surroundings. More than 300 kilometers in latitude and 100 in longitude. In the following generation, Anavrata succeeded in unifying essentially what would later constitute the uh, same extent of modern day Birmania. Right? Anavrata carried this out naturally in a in a series of campaigns right in the near Shan hills that um, extended south towards lower Burma up to the Tenasserim coast to Phuket and not uh, Arakan. The conquest of Tenasserim by Anavratha was particularly important internationally because it managed to check uh, the expansion uh, 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 along this coastline of the Khmer Empire that was, as you know, based on Cambodia and ruled over also over Vietnam, over essentially the central eastern um, Indochina, if you, if you want to call it like this, proving the power of the Pagan Kingdom. Right, uh, this uh, Tenasserim coastline was particularly important because there were many transit points between the Indian Ocean and, and China. So obviously, the Pagan and the Khmer Empire wanted to maintain control of them, and from from that side, of course, was um, say shifted west because the Pagan kingdom was the the, the weaker of, of the two, but still. Um, there was a capacity, in fact, of the locals to check the Khmer uh, expansion, right? Um, this, um, uh, say, the extension of the Pagan Kingdom under Anavratha made the country entering in a sort of acme of, of prosperity, at least relatively to the country's history, that would last, in fact, until the Mongol invasions. We do know that there were rebellions internally, um, but it is true what the Chinese were profiling about the relative stability of, of the system. Right? There weren't particular reasons to simply struggle in a territorial sense for power. At best, there could be internal, say, political problems, but the population was uh, 
under the elite. Uh, the system was expanding anyway, so there was enough um, control and sort of unity of intents to remain within this uh, this broader river basin sheltered by the mountains and pressured also by uh, potential external threat right uh, united right uh, the most serious rebellion occurred between 1082 and 84 this um, was carried by the Pegu Bago and it it almost managed essentially to overthrow the pagan establishment uh, however in the the tense of the 12th century there was um, even an ex a further ex um, expansionistic capacity of the pagans who um, sent in fact one force to Arakan to place its claimant Laitha Min Nan on the local throne um, and a second one actually because the first one failed uh, but the second one in 1118 succeeded right and this shows also again the sort of elementary political and strategic projection capacities uh, of this uh, of this power we know that elephants were a, a big deal in this country even if also for feudal power um, and the Sinhalese Ma Vamsa Chronicles tells us so it's from it's from the outside that there was a dispute in fact between uh, Burma and uh, Sri Lanka uh, regarding the trade in elephants between the two countries obviously via sea and this would prompt the Ceylonese to actually raid lower Burma from from the sea in 1180 uh, this is fascinating because it tells you also the, the degree of projection of of the Sri Lankan powers we will talk about them I made I think a very brief video about medieval Asia in a nutshell but um, there were interesting things going on in naval warfare in Southeast Asia uh, in the first place we will see better in some other video All right. the peak of pagan power was reached under the king Narapati Setu ruling between 1174 and 1211 this is important as far as the organi organization of the Royal Burmese Army that dates back to those times um, essentially is um, is concerned because the monarchy establishes uh, at this point the Royal Palace Guard we are in 11 74 and this is at least the first say the first documentation of uh, of a standing army in the pagan kingdom that of course had say always existed because of course uh, palace guards had always been there as much as presumably other uh, corps of uh, troops uh, gravitating around uh, the monarchy uh, at this point, the Pagan Kingdom also extended its influence further south into the Upper Malay Peninsula, right? At least to the Salvain River in the east, below essentially the current China border, in, so in the farther north, uh, and to the west, uh, so as we've seen, the northern Arakan and the Chin Hills. And up to the 13th century, essentially, the, the again, Indochina was shared between the Pagan Empire and the Khmer one. Um, there was a general prosperity of the scene, especially during the 13th century, that however was undermined by the relative lack of central public authority as always in the systems. Essentially the system had over feudalized, right? There was um, a disproportionate increase of um, tax free um, religious lands this is important because it's something we've seen in part even among uh, the the northern Tibetans or even though those remain significantly more, more warlike that the entire system was based on monasteries by some kind and the elite essentially controlled them um, so by um, it's like the say exemptions the uh, immunities that the church enjoyed in, in the West right except at this point the elite was so overly elite that they just found a way to uh, essentially 
alienate two thirds of the entire upper Burmese lands, cultivable lands, by the way, uh, to these, um, to this, essentially, uh, religious foundations that were just like enormous latifundia, uh, that as such, uh, not say were so enormous, just like from within the system that. Yes, they allowed the establishment to control it. It was just a proof of it, the reflection of the control in the land. But also de incentivize further um, cultivation and sort of more intensive one. Uh, while, in fact, the large uh, majority of, of the people, the masses of the peasantry, was excluded. All right. So this was a way to control, to check the... Uh, the local courtier and military servicemen, because of course there were troops provided by these religious centers, it was a way to maintain loyalty, but even at least in a state that would that had not developed a a real strong public uh, authority, etc. So eroding the basis of the same actually manpower and, and resources that uh, Burma had, and this would. Uh, exposed, in fact, the pagan kingdom to external challenges, because the peoples like Mons, Mongols, and Shans um, would spot this weakness to take advantage of this to overrun, uh, to conquer the country. There were some first signs of also internal unrest, for example, um, under, we will see now, the, the king Nara Theha Pate, uh, given that uh, came to rule in 1256, and that would be defeated by the Mongols. But that had already uh, faced, actually, some revolts in, uh, in the Arakan state of Makagiri. Essentially, it's today's Kyoa, um, Kyao Piu. Um, and in the west, Martaban, that is Motam, in the south. Um, the latter was actually put down but the one in Makagiri not, right, it required uh, a twofold expedition before it was quelled. There was yet another revolt uh, after the defeat against the Mongols in 1285 in Martaban, but that's another picture that we will see better um, later when we talk about the Mongols. So if we were to offer a picture of the Burmese army organization, we have seen that the first data available with, say, concretely dates to 1174, sort of the foundation of the Royal Burmese Army, uh, that was organized into a small standing force of a few thousands, right, defending Pagan, the capital, and, and obviously the palace, the royal palace. Um, and then, again, lots of conscripts that could be drawn um, in times uh, of, of war, right? The record, the levy system was known as Kyundao, right? The later Burmese dynasties would uh, call it Am Amudan, right? But this is just notionism. And it simply worked on the duty of the local chiefs to provide with that pre-established quota of troops from their district, right? on essentially a population basis, and again, it's just an average militia levy, right? And there were, of course, more, say, more elite troops also within these districts, right? Um, except for the fact that the bulkiest uh, forces, you know, as a backbone of the of the royal army, derived from the uh, the feudal. Uh, elite that control, in fact, most of the districts, but had a sort of upper military compared to the to the levies. Right. Um, this uh, we we don't see that the basic system of military organization change particularly much. Um, also, for looking at later colonial times, where naturally things are much better documented, that the Burmese had uh, modified particularly their their way of war. Of course, there were important changes, like there could be throughout the, the entire Middle Ages until the modern era, but fundamentally we're looking at pretty similar uh, organization. Um, of course, we have seen a, an initial phase 
under the Nansau of a sort of um, warfare, like a more feudal equestrian culture, raiders uh, conquering the land. Right. But um, we know that as early as that, of course, whenever these lords settled down, they had their conscripts to levy. Right. There are, of course, um, earlier kings to Anavrata that uh, use the same system of permanent troops on duty in the palace um, before 1174. Um, these were a bit, like, of course, it was a sacred nature of this palace guards. It were a bit the nucleus around which that the mass levy assembled in time of war. They were the essentially professional troops. They, we call them palace guards, but they had, of course, different mansions, militarily speaking, outside Albert. Um, and they, in fact, constituted the bulk of the uh, pagan armies. Uh, on on campaign as well, right next to at least as the ultra elite. It's like you say, I don't know, the Janissaries for for the Ottoman, right? They they had, of course, we are in different times, but I mean that you you have that plus a feudal elite and then also the levies. Um, we know, of course, that the numerical majority of the Burmese armies were infantrymen, but there was plenty of elephantry cavalry. And also naval corps, as a matter of fact, because we're an interesting fluvial and maritime uh, warfare here. That was, as you understand, especially in the first case, very important for internal control because the country was just run by across by the river from north to south. That was the main axis. So if you had um, an effective riverine flotilla, you could um, control the, the most important centers that were on these rivers, as we've seen, the same pagan capital surely was well equipped with arsenals and also of, of uh, you know, yards to 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 build ships and more. Um, there were some uh, specializations based on uh, hereditarity, right? That could have to do even with specific villages that were deputed. Uh, to the military activity as opposed to others who were more, I don't know, specialized in craftsmanship, whatever. This is interesting because it's plenty of cultures in, in anthropology that, that do this and they essentially are just a, a structural evolution of a rota system with just that community that has to provide with the troops and the others have effectively to uh, to provide the means of um, there wasn't, for this reason, also a, a dramatic military specialization of the Burmese army. You mostly have the bulk of the forces as heavy infantry, then you had the skirmishers, and um, their, as you'll see now, their, their equipment was not dramatically advanced. They had pretty light armor in, on average, right? There, there were some ultra-heavy warriors, of course, but overall, given the the absolute and relative amount of wealth uh, available across the populace that the general warfare was per relatively light, right? Because it could be a prosper land by some degree, but it had not undergone a, a major civilizational development al altogether. There were still somehow areas, um, say, uh, in part controlled by nature, more difficult for just even an army to, to go through, etc. So everything was a more uh, say based on the sort of moral and material hegemony of the of the center controlling these waterways and then the rest of the population just accepting that also because of course constituted authority worked as a sort of police it could as we've seen stabilize and prevent say coastal communities from being taken over by the mayors they could they, they would exact tributes actually from from this and the neighbors we listed before and cumulate surplus which the beautiful temples that i also inserted here among the pictures of course of, of burma um are really uh testify um definitely upper burma remained the most populated area was the natural center of political gravity uh, the south was less hospitable, more, say, wilder in, in a way. So, of course, consider that there is China from in the north, 
um, that this word civilization mostly comes from and the rest is a bit like a sort of uh, inhospitable jungle uh, the more you proceed towards the south um, so that's more or less the mechanism naturally making it simple but uh, that's uh, that's pretty much it. now regarding the size of Burmese armies um, there are relatively um, say accurate uh, debatably accurate uh, ciphers that are given um, it, it is believed that the likely absolute military strength of the pagan kingdom rested on something between 30 and 60,000 men right this is not an exaggeration when you understand of course that 30,000 men was a bit like the the standardly largest army you could field uh, at once right a single army to tactically uh, and functionally uh, employ right 60,000 men could be just you know uh, a pretty strong effort to use two armies at a time and of course it was a larger population in general um, so this again goes pretty much in parallel with a normal sort of regional size power right um, considered that uh, one inscription by King Sithu II that sometimes is credited I think there is some problem with the chronologies um, at a point um, the um, would have been the same one at 1174 instituted the palace guards but um, the point being that that moment um, onwards was the uh, the moment to greatest extent of of the pagan kingdom well we have a source uh, about the ruler telling him to be the lord of 17,645 soldiers while another source uh, claims 30,000 soldiers and cavalry under his command right so this is an interesting number because at least there were multiple armies that were levied at different times so it wouldn't be anything strange to see at the maximum again those 30,000 men and that 17,645 I don't know even you know how reliably precise should it be for at least for which reason but it absolutely plausible right the Chinese uh, say that there was at a point um, a Burmese army of 40 or to from something from 40 to 60,000 including 800 elephants and 10,000 horses and this actually intertwines with Marco Polo's account we'll see it now um, for the battle um, of the against the Mongols also here I think there are some sort of because um, there were multiple battles such as the one of um, Gasun, Gyan, etc but there are also different names attributed to them so it's a bit messier than, than it seems but it's that period and it was basically the, the late pagan kingdom still with substantial amount of forces um, Marco Polo actually that, that was the uh, an eyewitness um, of the battle of Ochan or at least you know, it was there with the Mongol army that fought against the Burmese, uh, mansions, 10,000 cavalry and 50,000 infantry. So again, some scholars, uh, for, for some reason, not a better identified one, say that, uh, well, well, the Burmese were more like, again, lots of infantrymen, and uh, no, there was actually a substantial amount of cavalry, and this is not so strange, of course, we do not know too much about what this cavalry was about, the, se the segmentation, say how many ar heavily armored um, cavalrymen there were among this tent. It's possible there were as few as 1,000 or, you know, um, maybe just a couple of thousand. And we know, by the way, that the Burmese army at the Battle of Piedev uh, Tagyun in uh, 1084 had employed units of 1,000 men in size. Uh, which may have maybe something to do with the heavy as as opposed to the rest of the troops that would follow with those um but it's um it's just like a, a an hypothesis 
Marco Polo's numbers are pretty big, like altogether 50,000 infantry. Um, no, right? Uh, they may have been like something, in fact, like, I don't know, 30,000 infantry, the largest, and say 3,000 cavalry, considered that there were lots of elephants there too, so think about the logistical strength. This is not to say that we have to reduce force lead numbers um, down, especially consider the Burmese here were fighting home, and that also in the general studies of the pre-colonial uh, pre -colonial population of Myanmar, we get estimates of forty to 60,000 for the uh, entire military um, to be a fairly likely uh, number. Right, we are told of the same for the 16th and uh, to, the, to the 19th century. And considering that here we are before the Black Death, surely, uh, again, there was a peak in the 13th century of manpower available to the Pagan Kingdom. And it shouldn't be strange or exaggerated. There is to, to say, actually, that the, the Sino-Mongols tended to of course, increased dramatically the numbers of the, uh, the the enemy forces. It's actually a normal thing in Eastern cultures. It's not even a sort of you know evil doing to say, haha, we, we showed that we were against larger forces, so the all, all the the people coming in the future will believe that. It, it's literally a matter of you know of the harmony of proportions, right? Of, of squaring numbers, speaking by big uh, numbers and scale, etc. This is something we've seen also, I don't know, between the um, the Western Frankish uh, historiography during the Crusades that, you know, in Europe was pretty, pretty accurate, let's say, could exaggerate the numbers of the enemy as well, but um, definitely in Islamic historiography there are less sources and providing with much larger numbers uh, say much larger exaggerations in absolute terms that for them is you understand is completely normal from a historiographical and literary point of view so you have to put this into account uh, considering that the Chinese had pretty large forces so you know if they said that they had had troubles here at the fringes of the empire against the savages as they saw them um, you know the that uh, you know you had to inflate a bit the numbers, but again, like a, there wouldn't be so much strange to see a, a similarity even between the same Chinese or or Indian forces in the in the in the Burmese army uh, as a whole, right? Even in the proportion of um, infantry, especially as of course with 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 India, the elephants. But um, uh, this is it. Um, so any other attempt to say how many, we will talk about it now because there is a problem of how many troops could the elephants uh, carry, right? Because we are a bit habituated in, in the, say, when we look at elephants, war elephants in classical antiquity, in more famous battles, to say, well, you know, it was just a couple of guys, right, on a turret, maybe. Um, uh, there weren't that many. But there actually were historically, um, and especially in the Indian, uh, say in the broader, let's say in the Indian subcontinent and beyond, um, actually pretty large amounts of troops that the elephants regularly carried. And as we will see, the same Marco Polo and other sources from later time, from late, the late Middle Ages, the early modern age, from the West actually witness, right? So. Um, calculating the amount of elephantry uh, is is complicated as much as determining exactly how many men were carried by the elephants. All we can say is that elephants were quite important overall. They they were logistically devastating, but they had their smashing effect on, on the battlefield, and the Burmese made a significant use of that, uh, like in India. So we could go as far as saying that even, I don't know, 30% of the Burmese uh, forces were carried by elephants at a point. We'll see now a bit what kind of tr 
troops these were concretely. Right? So now let's talk about the Battle of Bochan that takes place at the time of Kublai Khan, right? So the founder of the Yuan Dynasty of China and the fifth Kagan Emperor of the Mongol Empire from 1260 to 1294, um, he uh, proclaimed himself the dynastic name of Great uh, Yuan, right? And in uh, 1271, he he ruled Yuan China, in fact, until his death in 1294. Um, Wu sent one of his generals, Nasr al Din. Interestingly enough, um, he was he was a provincial governor of Yunnan during the Yuan Dynasty. Right, and as you understand from the name, it, it's an uh, an Arabic one, which stands from the fact it was the son of Said Ayal Shams al Dinar Omar, which was a Khwarezmian, right? That, as you know, had uh, w- w- you know was a nationality that had been overrun by the Mongols early on in their um, conquests uh, in the West, and they had been co-opted as part of the the local elite, as the Khwarezmians were also pretty good uh, fighters. And, uh, you know, they knew how to, to lead a same Mongol army for the Mongols, right? And there is this picture for which um, the Battle of Ochan in 1272 is caused by the attempt of the Mongols to knock at the Burmese door and say, can we get in, right? We can, in other words, can we vassalize you? Um and the story goes that the aforementioned King Nara the Hapata, the same one that had started to um, uh, to worry for for the rebellions that were spreading at that time, um, refused. At least he accepted the Mongol embassy. But as soon as these um, Mongol ambassadors uh, emissaries entered. Uh, his palace, he began to vexate them, saying that they hadn't literally taken off their shoes out of respect towards the king, uh, or they hadn't done it more often, and so had them assassinated. So however things went, which of course may have been just, you know, less dramatic, or maybe this thing of the, of the shoes was really an important deal of court etiquette, also for for respect towards the pagan monarch, but equated to say, okay, you know, you want to essentially transform us into a tributary state, come here and get uh, what you want, which was not an insight. Um, you know, p- perhaps the, uh, at least the, the, the best way to get out of trouble. But if you count on the fact that still, you know, the Burmese had their own military uh, pride, they, they, you, you gotta appreciate. They, they took their stand and they faced the same Mongol army, putting them also in some kind of trouble initially. Um, actually, the the Battle of Ochan, of course, is a disra- disastrous Burmese defeat. Uh, by 1287, all of Burma was vassalized and incorporated into the Mongolian Empire. There were different battles again um, uh, throughout this time. Um, and let's simply uh, analyze it because um, especially of the Marco Polo's uh, information that gives us significant details tactically about the battle. Again, Marco Polo was in the Mongol army at this point because, as you know, he was this Italian merchant who had gone, like many Europeans, to China uh, at the time. There are people who question the historicity of his diaries, whatever, but it, it's, you know, all what he writes is actually pretty relevant uh, in any case. And it in this case, it actually also matches what you would think like a battle between the Burmese and the Mongols would have unfolded. So, of course, we take it as as reliable, also because it's pretty much all we have. So that that's the beauty of history in a way. So after having beheaded the Mongol ambassadors, the Burmese king Narathi Hapate gathered an army to prevent the Mongol Khan's forces to invade his country. There were anywhere from 800 to 2,000 war 
elephant. Um, Poitiers says uh, the former figure, Marco Polo the latter, as a matter of fact. Um, and this is still a remarkable number in general because even 800 elephants alone are a substantial you know, um, shock force plus all the supplies and logistics. But elephants in, in technically were also used um, for carrying, um, of course, other, uh, say, supplies and not just um, the troops, but uh, we have to imagine to have there been a, a distinction between, in fact, the more uh, warlike elephants and the ones used just for, uh, you know, logistical purposes. In any case, they have to eat a freaking lot, so it, it's not an easy thing. For that. And here we are obviously looking at the fighting element. Um, the the scale is is remarkable because we are in the thousands anyway. Even eight hundred basically approaches to that. Uh, Marco Polo describes the beasts stating that there were from 12 to 16 armed men fighting uh, on each right so if you make the of course the math there have allegedly 24,000 to 32,000 men carried by elephants doesn't sound quite practical as such so it's likely that either the elephants were really less in order to were less armed fighting uh, crew um, on, on the elephant. Um, we will see that actually figures for the number of troops um, are accurate when we look now at, briefly at the troop types to to imagine as also how they were equipped right but uh, the Italian author says again that there were 10,000 cavalry and 50,000 infantry it's surely a bit inflated right if we have to think to, to was the all the the pagan kingdom forced there to stop the Mongols. We can more likely see some thirty thousand infantry maximum and some less cavalry, depending on cavalry. Because for Western sources, we're habituated to look at cavalry during the thirteenth century, mostly just in the heavily armored element, because there wasn't practically any any other. Right here. In Burma instead, well, it's likely that the troops were a bit lighter on average, but we shouldn't just even consider this as a, as an assumption that, you know, uh, the, the heavily armored were just a few, right? We can't accept uh, multiple thousands of that too with some lighter component. Uh, as well, and remember always that the feudal Tibetan influence in this military cultures, uh, that, as we described it in the other video. So the battle takes the name after the plain of Boshan, that's where Nasr al-Din had arrived, with only, by the way, 12,000 well-trained veteran Mongol troops, interestingly enough. Um, the Mongols were in their battle order waiting uh, for the enemy to take on them right and this was naturally done in the expectation of gaining some advantage from the defense that as we will see here reminds us something um, almost hundred years warlike right um, in any case the Mongols the Mongols do not need to be presented I will make lots of more videos about them hopefully but I also already made a lot on them they were essentially uh, essentially one at least at the top of, of the military quality in the world um, at the time they they hadn't so extremely easy especially in Southeast Asia uh, that was a bit of a difficult terrain to fight in but as we know these were not troops scared by fighting I don't know in, in the Rus in winter and in fact in Indochina, that was not exactly one of the best. Those who speak of, you know, uh, humidity um, crippling the the Mongol um, bows, right, the bow strings, and you know that they they pulled out of uh, they pulled out of Europe because you know it was raining Hungary, man, it must have been that. Well, yeah, you know, just including invading um, 
uh, Russian winter, one of the driest, you know, climates that you can imagine. It, it is true that in Southeast Asia it wasn't that much of a luck, but that has barely anything to do with that. Of course, there were many logistical strains. And here, in fact, relatively few troops, if we are to trust uh, the sources here that were conservative about the Mongol ones, even if to perhaps exaggerate the, again, the, the numerical difference, surely there weren't, uh, as we've seen here, 60,000 Burmese and against uh, 12,000 Mongols, also because the Burmese would have won, by the way. Um, because, yeah, uh, numbers do matter, especially the larger the scale of the engagement. But aside from this, the sense here is that the Mongols were outnumbered, at least. They had cleverly deployed the army um, off to one side uh, of a huge forest, right, protecting their right flank specifically, so to avoid also outflanking at least from that uh, side. Um, and the Burmese seemingly went uh, on with their standard tactics of elephant charge, right. Um, this was um, carried out after, of course, the elephant riders were issued to mount their beasts, etc. Uh, we can imagine all the, say, the complexity of these, um, say, of the lining up of elephant, right? And or it's not technically that difficult, but there is all a timing you have to. If we think there were from 16 to uh, 32 warriors, um, as we will see now from from some numbers, on these elephants, that's like the equivalent of loading um, uh, a war horse with a heavily armored knight, right? You exhaust a freaking animal um, and you have to do it as late as possible, right? Um, and uh, Nasr al-Din at this point realized that the Mongol horses that, as you know, were pretty much... Um, all one with their riders. I made a video specifically about the Mongol horse, and you know, Mongol warfare was essentially relying on on, on mounted uh, mounted forces. Were scared, predictably, by the war elephant. So, having acknowledged this, Nasr al-Din ordered the Mongols to dismount, right? And their horses were tied to the trees of the forest nearby. At this point, what was the deal was essentially to defend, right? As we've seen, if there was a brutal uh, numerical disproportion, at least one for which you wouldn't venture out there to, because how, right? It, the enemy is stronger than you in attack just by uh, out sheer, um, you know, numerical power. Plus, they have freaking war elephants in the front. So even the heaviest Mongol cavalry is going to be uh, wasted uh, against them. So that's why I said the Hundred Years' War before uh, as a similarity, because the uh, Mongols dismounted and began to shoot with their uh, bows at the elephants. Naturally, as I explained countless times, it's not the light troops such as the bowmen that make the difference. It was evidently a heavy component, but the Mongols surely had a capacity to switch also from spear to, to bows and say, in a more hybrid way than, say, most troops out there, even though they, they were actually specializing the two differences that were really normal. Most horse archers were, well, most horsemen were, were archers on a regular basis, and of course there was just um, an elite of heavy cavalrymen on a regular basis that did not exceed the half, right, in the greatest proportions. So, this seems like a desperate situation, and the Mongols do not shoot at the crews, they shoot at the animals themselves. And the point here is that they were taken down, essentially a great number of elephants were either killed or wounded, which, even though we're pretty sure that there was some sort of um, capars and some sort of bad armor, at least for, for the elephants, at least in, in the heaviest cases, um, and that especially elephants loaded, uh, you know, in tents of, 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 of men, perhaps are using the same men as human shields, uh, still they were somehow vulnerable. 
uh, to the Mongol arrows. We, we cannot know what, whether that's how the thing really went. But um, we want to appreciate what we're told, and so the elephants uh, start running amok, right? They felt the sting of the Mongol arrows, even though the elephants have pretty thick skins, but it's, it's like a little all together, just all the various punctures managed to, to, to annoy them enough. And Marco Polo tells us that the elephants turned tail and fled from the field as a consequence. So this uh, turned, in fact, into a, a real mess because, um, as Marco Polo describes this, fundamentally as a sort of prelude to the end of the world, there is a, a, a dramatic uproar of the routing beasts that entered uh, into the forest. They plunged, they began to tear and, and rip the, the superstructures they, they had uh, mounted on off, dashing the unfortunate riders to the ground and crushing them to death. Um, and we're not told, I think, uh, whether they uh, they smash into their own battle lines or something, which doesn't seem to have happen also because there were some sort of safety measures of this. We, we don't know how these troops were arrayed, but it's likely, of course, there was a significant distance between each one, especially the elephants that could be that dangerous at close range if if um, becoming crazy. Um, in any case, the elephants are out of the picture. And what, what do the Mongols do? They remount on their horses. This is fascinating because it gives you also a dimension of, of a battle timing, right? And once on horseback, they at this point do charge the Burmese, right? We do not know here again how much cavalry there was uh, from the Burmese side, um, but we are told once again that the Mongols were fighting against a multitude of enemies, and we know at least that the fight went on for several hours. So much so that at noon the Burmese were exhausted and they also withdrew, with the Mongols in hot pursuit, right? And we do not surely there was some, you know, some units collapsed, were routed, um, others managed to pull out of the battlefield, um, presumably in a safe way. Because uh, it normally happens when you have especially multiple battle lines and you have essentially bet on that to in order to save at least the last one that is usually also the the elite one but we're we're not really sure about this either um, we know that the mongols managed to capture 200 of the elephants so much so that from this battle on kublai khan kept his own stock of these burmese beasts um, and he also mounted on a platform between between four elephants the same his own personal great standard right um and this gives after all uh merit to 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 the power of the same burmese that were uh, seen as a worthy prey evidently also considering that now burma was to be overrun by the mongols right and from there on, the tribute from the Burmese to China was, of course, paid yearly in war elephants, right? Um, this is how we think, more or less, the battle went. Um, the, the Mongols uh, systematically seized uh, the, the country. They secured their hold on Kangai, that is... Uh, today's uh, in uh, Yang Yunnan, uh, 112 kilometers from Bamel, right? The Mongols moved south between 1283 and 85, occupying uh, south up to Ta Gaung and Hanlin. Um, and the king Narathi uh, Pate fled to the wilder southern lands in the same 1285, before finally, in the June of the following year, accepting the submission to the Mongols. Right. Um, 
which made him leave for just other 13 months as he was assassinated in July 1287. And the Mongols invaded again south towards Pagan, by the way, uh, to reestablish further order. So this is a pretty grim picture of what happened to Burma uh, after this. Given that uh, the Pagan Kingdom was destroyed in the process and the land was fragmented in various sub-kingdoms that um, henceforth began to fight against one another. Right? What uh, basically happened at the king's death is that every vassal state rebelled and started going its own way. In the south, Barrero was the same guy that had rebelled and seized control of Martaban in 1285, consolidating uh, the areas uh, inhabited by the, the Mon speaking people of Lower Burma uh, and r declared, by the way, this land of the Mon, that is the Ramanadesa, independent in 1287. Arakan in the west to stop paying tribute because there was nobody to pay to could exactly could have the deterrence required for these guys to freak out about it. So after a fourth of a millennium this empire had ceased to exist and would be followed by others that basically um, didn't have much of a you know uh, that wouldn't restore the, the, previ the prior, previous unity right of, of what more or less corresponds to, to the modern country of, of Myanmar. Um, so, some detail about the troops' typologies and the armament that the Burmese would field. Right. First of all, um, again, the, this, this land was not overwhelmingly developed from a civilizational point of view, right? And the basic weaponry was pretty simple, right? If you look at Vietnam from, from the other side uh, of, of the region in the East, you realize that um, still during the Vietnam War in the 20th century, the Vietnamese used a crossbow that is um, almost identical to those used as booby traps. Uh, and so you, there is there a material primitiveness and uh, poverty that still however was you know dating from very very far back in time right so if just we want to be slightly better documented we can presume that the Burmese had the same type of weaponry that the Vietnamese were using at the time bamboo javelins uh, spears of different type, but mostly short, because um, there weren't presumably such large infantry forces provided with enough cohesion to have the, the necessary collective training to form functional pike uh, formations on the field. This is true because, as we've seen, these populations were normally just agricultural subjects, um, brutally disarmed, while most, most essentially all of the power was in the hands of the elites that brutalized them and it was in fact as radically violent as the military ultra elite can be. Um, we see also just average um, weapons you could find like self bows, uh, metal machete like swords, uh, which you can imagine in the jungle being useful of course. So these are all weapons that you can produce fairly easily just in, in the village communities uh, and so on. We even have a primitive type of crossbow, as we have seen, similar, by the way, to the ones we know the Burmese used. Um, so there is a commonality there, and this is fascinating, because when we talk medieval here, we, of course, think that uh, the, the crossbow is a big deal. But as I explained to you, there is nothing, take multiple times, there is nothing really clamorous in the concept of a crossbow, right? The, the sense that a crossbow was introduced at some point, it caused a technological revolution, that the entire medieval warfare was not real, right? The crossbow was always there from antiquity, um, even in some of the most primitive areas of, of Europe, uh, it never died out, uh, 
um, and it uh, it was spread in late antiquity say in the Roman army we find them among the Picts right and generally speaking the crossbow is a dangerous weapon against cavalry so we, we don't have to think of course this was a, a much of a game changer but the sense that cavalry would operate like in Europe and other countries with some missile troops at their fl- at their side to harass the, the flanks of the enemy uh, in open order falling on, on, on the enemy on the cavalry uh, the enemy cavalry flanks if the the wings of crossbowmen or out or even heavy infantry at the point had not been taken out is pretty much out there right I described this for the um, for the Karakithai too that had a seemingly pretty advanced type of warfare also on the base of infantry even though they were Mongols and predecessors of the same one of King Khan, like in the 12th century um, but being more from the Chinese side in this sense perhaps a bit more civilized so in Southeast Asia you would have of course crossbows again simple primitive not dramatic uh, devil once like you start seeing Europe is a bit tougher it has more widespread say wealth uh, per capita etc you start seeing really uh, powerful massive you know amounts we've seen it the other day in the video about um, medieval mercenaries uh, elite crossbowmen formations causing pretty significant damage but of course consider that as we were contemplating about cavalry before uh, the same Burmese cavalry may have not necessarily been on average particularly heavy so everything was proportioned to uh, to the circumstances uh, and even though as we've seen the peasantry was not particularly powerful still it was easy to build a crossbow all right and to for that to hurt right um, there were archers a lot of them, as far as we understand, also these are light infantrymen, just like as the crossbow, and they're not more relevant, contrary to what people think, to to infantry. To have infantry properly meant the one that you know stops and you know takes on in hand-to-hand combat and and has a significant resistance. Um, and um, we have we mentioned Vietnam before, saying that it was better documented but not excessively much on the truth but still better than than Burma right so we do not have too much info about uh, the say even iconographic representations of these warriors etc after the Mongol invasions there was uh, a, a massive destruction of art objects that unfortunately destroyed most of the then existent um, artifacts so it's a bit of a tragedy telling you the truth um, you see here that also as far as the pictures go I am adapting uh, to it uh, when I make a bit more of niche topics about which there is usually but not always um, few info um, we know of the descriptions of the Burmese warriors um, concurring however with a fresco at Vet Ki and Ki Biang Ki, which dates to the early 13th century, so a fairly advanced time, that shows actually a pretty simple, um, of course, suit for for an archer, right, unarmored as you can expect, and or with a with a simple helmet, even of of some organic material, and that's literally it, right? There could be more or less different types of protection um, normally lighter troops were naked also depending on, on the weather etc um, so uh, but this is a basic archer there's nothing practically to, to add to that um, seemingly around 800 AD kingfisher feathers were quite common to distinguish warriors from one another so it's possible that as late as the 13th century this type of rank distinctions were still out there again these were peoples emerging from a relatively tribal background from a relatively recent time so not again the peak of civilizational development you may you, you, you may still find this um, archaism in their in their equipment we know 
that the Mon people in, in the south had the Amsa, uh, that is to say, uh, the wild goose, a device probably appearing in the form of a standard or shield device, right, and used possibly by the crossbow unit of the Mon guard. And this could mm, um, hint at some sort of more advanced sort of Pavis type of concept, like you use these shields to protect your your elite troops, because if you know there is a a guard right that uses crossbow and plausibly these are somehow better than the rest of the troops, so they, you may want to protect them, and so just a simple shield, right? There's, but issued with certain specific characteristics and or properly supplied by arsenals may have been a distinctive um, feature of some sort but we're not even concretely sure of what this Hamsa wild goose would have would have been um, speaking of infantry well we can think again that an average uh, Burmese commoner would go at war with a, with a spear, so not particularly long one, and a simple shield, and maybe just some sort of organic um, material made helmet, right? If it was lucky, you could add something more. So it's difficult here even to draw the difference between something armored or unarmored, right? We think that, however, the most common type of equipment, also considering what the Chinese said before about the silk cotton um, would be quilted pads of cotton, in fact uh, making up the majority of armor swords by certain degree depending on what we're talking about like, you know, machetes style kind of stuff, but also something a bit more developed, something with a more um, you know, with a straighter swords with a shifted bar center toward the top would have been the thing, especially for cavalry but, um, again, speaking of infantry, mostly we know that short spears were, of course, the basic uh, type of weapon. This is the cheapest, most effective um, in terms of cost-benefit ratio, and just a few troops could afford, of course, better uh, equipment. We are told that the Mon Guard carrying gilded swords, shields, and helmets, again, this is exactly one of those elite course, so definitely not the norm. Speaking of cavalry, we can say pretty much the same, right? Kilted cotton armor would have been pretty much um, the the average. You would find something heavier, of course, um, you know, lamellar armor like the Tibetans, and so that broader influence there would be such, such kind of troops on a, on a 1 to 10 basis when talk about cavalry likely this wouldn't be so strange um, short spears could be carried uh, together with small bucklers at least it depends on what kind of warfare these units would have been engaged most frequently in elite um, cavalry often had gilded helmets and we can think that, of course, there was some significant shock, you know, charge tactics with particularly compact uh, formations, and so also something more uh, smashing frontally with longer spears and so on. This wouldn't be strange at all. Just this would have represented the ultra elite. It would have not been just the most typical thing you could see around there, right? Especially in in the jungle, right? Where you see the Mongols never ventured, for example, in the forest world, etc. So these peoples around, you know, the capital, of course, in the more open plains would have had heavy cavalry. They would have been able to overrun infantry with their charges, but they couldn't quite go too much inland, right? Except the potential was relatively limited. The the cities had absorbed the, the surrounding production. They, they had always been ruled by these elites of some sort. But in this sense, don't think that the elite could not bench roles in very complicated terrain uh, given the, say, the, the emergential circumstances. 
Um, speaking of the war elephants, here I would just make some consideration about the uh, the numbers of of the of the crew, right? Because uh, we have different sources historically that give us in the Indian elephant carrying several uh, warriors, at least. For example, the third book of the Maccabees states that an Indian elephant could carry 32 warriors, besides the Mahout, by the way. Um, so even more people. Philostratus, is in, in his life of Apollonius too, too, tells us that 10 to 15 warriors could be carried on the elephant. We know that an elephant by, uh, sent by Timur Khan to the Sultan of Egypt uh, later in the Middle Ages, um, would have carried, at least on that occasion, 20 drummers. Nicola di Conti, who visited Burma in 1435, states that from 8 to 10 was the number, so we are in later times. This Western um, eyewitness tells us that um, at least these um, amount of men at least would have been uh, employable as, as an average, Caesar Frederick in 1568 tells us four. Christopher Barry uh, in Cochin, China. Um, so uh, this is from uh, 1633. Tells that the the Burmese elephant carried from 13 to 14 warriors, six on each side. Right, there would be some tiers of which they sat. Um, with two uh, for extra men guarding the rear, which. As you know, for the elephants, it's quite a delicate position because just like if you have studied the Punic Wars in detail, you know that uh, the only way to kill an elephant, practically, to, to take it out uh, of combat is to stick a lance in, in his rear end. So, as we've seen before with the Mongols showering the elephants with archers and the animals are starting to... To, to withdraw, to be disturbed by that. There were other ways, for sure, but the most practical one, also in type of warfare like this, that probably was not overwhelmingly about missile fire, or more punching force, and the elephants actually representing that. Um, you know, this could be also a, a clever way, and you, that's how you want to protect your elephant. Uh, and it's quite dangerous, because eventually the crews well, all these men on the crew serve exactly to keep the the other men out of say from the the, the elephant surroundings, right? So you don't want to make them approach. It's as if you were in a tower, and you have the the upper hand from it, and you can scare these other guys away. And, but you have to literally prevent them to infiltrate under the elephant, behind the elephant. And so you, you need some troops following on foot as well. Um, so we have an evidence of anywhere from 4 to 32 men and since for the Battle of, of Ochan um, Marco Polo states that there were from 12 to 16 crew uh, well this is a pretty average um, quantity that figure that we can absolutely accept as um, accurate um, I don't think that, well, of course, there were sort of heavier um, elephant units for which the crew men would have been more heavily armored as well. Um, but it's likely that the majority there is, because the, the purpose is, especially in open ground, is for the elephant to smash and taking the others behind him. So you don't need much fighting going on. Um, and the elephants get tired if you have all these men on and so you want to avoid wearing armor at least if the elephant is to perform this just shock charge um, with his own body by the way not much the crew men like this, these are not horsemen right but of course they would have been exposed and um, again this lack generalized lack of heavy armor seems of course to be a matter of symmetry at least within the within Burma that is where the local warfare was designed for so mostly uh, this lack uh, of armor in front of the smashing capacity of the elephant is 
the least of concerns. But the elephants would have been protected themselves, surely, at least in the heavier cases, by the aforementioned col uh, kilted cotton armor. Uh, this probably was an elite, right? But that's what you would have found more frequently. Um, the, the elephants would carry themselves um, supplies, by the way, uh, ammo, literally, for the crews as well. Uh, that were able uh, to be able to attack themselves at range because it was difficult of course for the elephants to allow the crews to to engage against one another it's not a ship uh, like the elephant also is trained to address and to do pretty heavy stuff against the other elephants and, and humans but um, the crews would engage themselves preferably um, through some even some hooks or stuff yes at closer range but mostly with missile weapons so there were quivers of bamboo javelins and arrows for the upper tiered archers that were also the least exposed from uh, the lower ground which is where most of the threat came from and so um, there was this important level of um, let's say of, of equipment of, of ammunition to allow this these guys by the way to go around uh, the elephants, as we've seen at Bochan, eventually the, the elephants smash the 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 structure they had on their backs. These guys fall, but on a say normally that's even that's something that unless the elephant is taken out should not happen, right? So you can still technically defend yourself before you come down the elephant, which, however, these guys would have been pretty well trained to do it fastly if they had to get out of the way quickly right and of course there is a lot to tell because we have also at some point to expose the various sources more in depth but um, this is I think a generally say presentable introduction to medieval Burmese warfare there is models for the later Middle Ages but again for today we look at this mostly um, so I hope we will make other stuff about this all soon, not just for any other content technically. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.